What a powerful message. What a powerful song. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Before we read this passage of scripture, you need to know that Philippi was not in Paul's original travel plans. In Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, it, it speaks of Paul and his traveling uh, group, his missionary evangelism group, or traveling around. They had their uh, itinerary was to go over to Bithynia, I believe, and said the Spirit said you can't go here. It hindered them from so I don't know what happened, but there was a roadblock in their way. That they couldn't go where they wanted to go. Well, they had a plan B. They had a plan B. They were going to go over here and over into Asia, I believe. And the Spirit forbid them to do that. So now plan A is gone and plan B is gone. And Paul, of course, and his missionary group were wondering where they were going to be and said the Lord spoke to him in the night and said, come to Macedonia, help us in Macedonia. And he ends up in Philippi, not on his original plan. It wasn't supposed to even happen, according to the Apostle Paul. And then once he got there, things just seemed to come unraveled from the very start. It didn't look like this was working out at all. See, Paul's original plan was to go to a town and go to the synagogue in town. That way you have a ready-made assembly of people. Philippi had no synagogue which means they didn't even have 10 Jewish men in town, which meant predominantly the whole town uh, was of Roman and Greek population. They worshipped Caesar. They worshipped idols. Very few God-fearing people in town, but there were a few women that met outside by the riverside. Didn't even have a building to start in. No platform, no building, no meeting place. What, what kind of place is this? I wasn't even planning on being here. But as we read through the letter that Paul has to the Philippians, we realize God knew what he was doing, and God used these people in a mighty way, and they became lifelong friends to the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Would you stand as the Scripture's read? Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long after you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. This I pray that that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent. You may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you so much for your story, the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've made us a part of this effort to tell the story to the nations, to the world. Father, as we look at this past description of these people in Philippi and your work with the Apostle Paul, we're in here. Help us to see ourselves. And Father, we ask that you would help us all to find our place in your plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Paul said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you with all joy. 
And he said this specifically. I thank my God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I want to look at that topic today, fellowship in the gospel. You see, they not only became lifelong friends of the Apostle Paul, and they were dear to him as friends, they became partners with him in the gospel. In other words, fellowship, some modern English translation says uh, partnership. Partakers, companions is a good word for fellowship. You see, fellowship involves a lot of different things, and he used that word for a very specific reason. And the people at Philippi not only had Paul for just a little while to start that work there, and they had their work there, and it started with just those women, and we understand there was a, a slave girl that was saved, and we understand there was a Philippian jailer and his and his family that was saved because Paul and Silas had this unplanned prison ministry for one night, and it worked out really well for them, and then they left town. But in that brief time, they became partners with Paul in the ministry, and he says, your fellowship in the gospel, and he says in verse 7, you're all partakers with me. You're in this with me. So that meant this. They had a part in every accomplishment, in every victory that Paul experienced from then on. Every soul that was reached, every church that was planted, they were a part of that. If you read on after that, you read he went to Thessalonica in chapter 17 and verse 4. It says multitudes of Greeks were, were saved. Now what does that mean? Well, Greeks were not Jewish people. They did not worship the God of the Hebrews. They worshiped idols. They had so many of them, they were afraid they would leave somebody out and make one of their gods mad, so they had a temple or a shrine to the unknown God. And Paul talks about this later on when he's in Athens. A multitude of idol-worshiping Greeks were saved in Thessalonica. The Philippians had a part of that. They were in fellowship and partner with Paul in the gospel. There, he went to Berea. And it says, and many believed. Many people believed. In Athens, the cultural capital of the world, he went right down the street where every one of these idols were on either side of the street. And they let him speak to all of these people. And he spoke con directly concerning their idol worship. And he says, I want to talk to you about this one that you say is the unknown God. I'm going to talk to you about him. You don't know him, but you can know him. And he presented to them Jesus Christ. Now, they were a pretty tough group. So just a few of them came to know the Lord. But you know what they said? We would like for you to come back. We would like to hear about this again. Then there's Corinth. At Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla. He served and lived with them for 18 months there in Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla became partners as well. And in fact, they traveled with him, and he left them at different churches. And we see their name pop up several different times. Then there's Apollos. Apollos was an eloquent man. He was a man of words. He was a mighty man. And his speaking and his debate skills... He, he encountered him, and so we realize a Corinth became a headquarters of people who made a difference. It was in Corinth that the ruler of the synagogue even accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The people at Philippi had a part in this. And then in this passage of Scripture, in the book of Philippians, he talks about his change, and he says, the whole palace guard is aware of the fact that I'm in chains because of Jesus Christ. The palace guard is typically the secret service for the emperor of Rome. And he speaks later on in the closing verses. All those at Caesar's household greet you. Paul had won people to the Lord that were in Caesar's house. Paul had won people to the Lord that were in the palace guard. And you see, the people at Philippi, the people at Philippi had a hand in this. They were partners in this. So we realize 
When he says, I'm thankful for your fellowship in the gospel, what it is, when he planted the church there, and the church, even though they had a local ministry, their local ministry didn't stay there. Their ministry went everywhere the apostle Paul did. That was thousands of miles. We don't know exactly when this letter was written. Paul's in jail somewhere, but he was in jail at least seven different times. And if this is in Rome, it was thousands of miles and many years after he wrote this. And he still said, you've got a part in what what I'm doing. The fellowship of the gospel. That means, of course, partnership. It means investment. It means involvement. And so our fellowship in the gospel, first of all, becomes much bigger than our own work. Now, it's important what we're doing here in the Brister community, Columbia County, North Louisiana, reaching people. It's important that you're reaching people in your field of mission work. And our field of mission work is where our feet is right now. And it's important that we're reaching the next generation with kingdom kids and Bible school and the youth program. It's important with all the benevolent ministries that people see the love of Christ. It's important that people are told in this county there's plenty of people who need to hear the story. And that's all important. And we need to be busy right here. But when we plug in and become involved and invest and partake in the gospel worldwide, then, of course, our influence goes far beyond the city limits. Now, the Philippian folks were fellowship with Paul's work of the gospel. Some of them probably never left the city limits of Philippi. And some people who may never leave Columbia County or Arkansas can be in fellowship and part of every victory of the people that we're in partnership with. At the present time, if you look at our financial sheet, if you're here on Sunday nights and you have business meeting, that's going to happen tonight, by the way. There are 17 different mission partners that we send money to. Send a total of over $4,000 a month to these various mission partners. And you see, because of that, every victory that these mission partners experience, every soul that is reached, and every life that is changed, Every church that is planted, Brister Baptist Church has a hand in this all over the world. Now, I don't have time to tell you everything that we're involved with, but let me just pick one. Let me pick one. And this, of course, was brought out at the national meeting. Brother Donnie Parrish told us what was going on with LifeWord. LifeWord started as the Harvest Gleaner Hour, a, a, a radio program up in the Little Rock area, and it started from there and went, of course, statewide and then nationwide, and all they did was was radio and print. About five years ago, LifeWord went on the internet. The reason they did went on the internet is like a lot of people don't have maybe electricity or running water at these villages, but now most people have a phone. Most people have a phone. And Five years ago, LifeWord got on the Internet. LifeWord, of course, tells the story. I appreciate what Brother Jeremy said last week when he said, gospel comes from the old English word Godspell, which means good story. And the gospel is the good story, and LifeWord is telling the good story. And you have to understand, they are telling the good story through broadcast, through internet and through printed media to millions of people in 160 languages every single day. Now, they got on the internet because the average person spends 145 minutes per day on social media this last year. 145 minutes per day on social media. 4.9 billion people use social media through the world in little villages as well as big towns. In 2023, the people we're in partnership with, the people we're in fellowship with in the gospel, LifeWord.org realized 27.6 million new visitors just in this past year. And that's the website for LifeWord. LifeWord 
has 1.4 million likes on their Facebook page. On Facebook alone, there's 47 million minutes of gospel video all over the world. On Facebook, LifeWord touched 225 million accounts. For every dollar that is spent by LifeWord, 100,000 Facebook accounts are reached. LifeWord is among the top 10% of all traffic generation, generating websites in the world. Top 10% of all traffic generating websites in the world. And you're a part of that. We're a part of that because they're in our budget. And we not only spend money with LifeWord on a regular basis, we take up special offerings with them. The broadcast team alone, over 250 people all over the world broadcasting in various ways, whether it be on the Internet or on radio, 160 languages. And they begin to hear from people all over the world, and, and they came together in the global ministry uh, headquarters in Conway, Arkansas, and here's some of the, just a fraction of what they hear in El Salvador. Someone says, we're able to organize a new mission into a church, a mission that the Life Word Director of Central America planted. In Bolivia, Life Word has helped me start a new church, and we're reaching out to other native groups in the area. In Africa, through Life Word programming, we're able to plant a new mission. In Ghana, Life Word programming is, is winning souls in my area. Joe Costa from Lebanon. We speak daily to skeptics, atheists, and Muslims. And right now, through Life Word ministry, 50 to 60 personal communications with those who watch our program. And you're a part of that. It's far beyond city limits of our area or the county line or even the state line. In 2024 and 25, they're going to start a program called Follow. It's a discipleship program. You see, God calls us to win souls. God calls us also to make disciples. And they're starting a discipleship program called Follow. What does it mean to follow Christ? They're going to try to target seven to ten new languages in this year alone to try to develop programming for people in their heart language. Now, we're a part of this. And as I mentioned before, we're a part of it because, of course, we have monthly support. But, of course, I am personal friends with several of the folks up in Life Word office. Not only do we have a partnership, we have a friendship. We have companionship. And if you remember several years ago, several years ago, they were in need of putting a transmitter up on a tall mountain in Peru. There was a city down below over in an area that they couldn't reach that was just saturated with idol worship. And missionaries couldn't go there. They needed a transmitter, a transmitter to broadcast the signal of life word programming over into that area. And if you remember, our church funded the transmitter. And because of our fellowship in the gospel, there's a transmitter operating right now in Peru that's reaching people who have never, ever heard the gospel. You see, our investment in the gospel becomes much bigger than our own work. And you see, we, we sang that song, Revive Us Again. Nothing brings revival to a church quite like being a part of the gospel. And our footprint goes worldwide because we're in fellowship with all these other mission partners. But this is what we need to know, too. Our investment in the gospel will outlast us. In verse 6, being confident of this very thing, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Christ. God began a good work in Philippi. God began a good work, and then Paul left town. The folks in Philippi, no doubt, had their work there. And I'm sure many of those may have gone to other places. And they reached lives and touched souls all in that region. But because they were in fellowship with the Apostle Paul, Paul, of course, went to Rome. 
and other people that were with Paul on to Europe. Europe, of course, meaning Scotland, England. That's, that's where we came from. And they went up to the, and those were wild people back then. You know where we get that? They were wild. They were wild up there. And the, a lot of the Romans didn't even want to go there. Those were some nasty folks. And they went and won those people to the Lord. And for centuries, Christianity grew in Europe. Then they discovered the new world. Well, it was new to them. It wasn't new to God, was it? And all of them started coming over here. And the gospel came with them. And you see, good work that God started in Philippi spread up to Rome, spread up to Europe, spread over to America, spread west, coming all the way over to Arkansas. And we are a direct result of their fellowship in the gospel 2,000 years later. You know, sometimes we are prone to look at what's going on just here and seeing what, what results and maybe the stats and the numbers that happen here, and we're prone to get discouraged because we think nothing's happening here, and we need to understand our investment and our fellowship and our partnership in the gospel may have its biggest impact after we're gone. Personal case in point. 1988, the lady Sunday school class heard about a young man over in Honduras, David Dixon. One of these accidents, like the Apostle Paul, ended up in a Garifuna village simply because he happened to take a vacation on a beach in Tela, Honduras, and heard two boys walk by him talking a language he had never heard. And they were talking Garifuna. He had never heard of these people. And he went over to their village. And the Garifuna people lived in village all up and down the coast of Honduras. Talking about a place where you wouldn't know where there was a lot of potential. In the village of Torna Bay, no streets. Very few people have running water. Little tiny, tiny village stuck there. And this is how remote they were. The, the officials in Honduras for decades, denied the Garifuna people even existed because they're black. And they denied that there were black people in the demographics and the population of Honduras for decades. They had been there for centuries. The Garifuna people were survivors of a slave ship wreck back in the late 1600s and ended up over there. And they were so remote, so outcast, so isolated that the brown-skinned Honduran people denied they were even in the land. Those were the people Brother David Dixon started preaching in an open-air ministry. They, they built a little hut so they could preach in. While he was preaching, young people would get up and start shouting, and he asked some of the guys that he knew and some of the people who were interested, what do they say? And he said, you don't want to know. During his sermon, they would get up and shout obscenities. This went on for years. Just couldn't break through. All right. That was in the early 80s. And in 1988, here at Bristol Baptist Church, our Lady Sunday School class heard about Brother David Dixon and Ricardo Ramirez, the new pastor of the church at Torna Bay. And they began to send money. They would take it up every week. And the lady Sunday school class of Brister Baptist Church would send money every quarter to, to Ricardo. And they would send money over there, and they begin to sponsor Ricardo. Year after year after year. And isn't that something that they sponsored this guy over in a remote village in the middle of just kind of nowhere of a people that just until recently were denied it even there. A little small hut. A little small village. What could come of that? Well, I'll tell you. But first of all, I've got the old directory here. And I think it's important for you to know who was in that Sunday school class. Nineteen ladies in the Sunday school class. 
Some in this picture and some are not in the picture, but let me read you their names. Nettie Jewel Watson, Betty Owen, Marie Wallen, Maddie Claire McMullen, Myrene Moore, Miss Mabel Wallen, Miss Willene Wallen, Eva Bradley, Sylvia Hyatt, Bobby Peace, Bessaloni Pryor, Mary Frances Dodson. Ruth Kyle, Patsy Sue Yates, Virgie Floyd. In this crowd's also Katie Triplett, Judy Hines, Sandra McWilliams, Cindy Curtis. Fifteen of these ladies have passed away. Since they faithfully gave their money, week after week after week. What happened to Ricardo? What happened to this young guy that was doing his best to just try to make a headway in this very, very tough situation? This is what they didn't see. This is what David Dixon told me yesterday on the phone. One little church, one little hut. Now they're well over a dozen Garifuna congregations, hundreds of members, hundreds of members, but this is where they are, Honduras, Belize, by the way, our church bought a piece of property for a congregation in Belize, we're partners with that, Guatemala, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. There is a Garifuna congregation standing room only, packing it out. Over a hundred people of Garifunas, a Garifuna congregation, and more than dozens of pastors. And he says these pastors are dedicated. These pastors are grounded. And watch this. These pastors are mission-minded. And this little mission church begin immediately to plant other churches and plant other churches and plant other churches. Ricardo has five villages in mind and already has people meeting in those five villages to bring them in and have churches there. Those 15 ladies didn't see all this happen. But they faithfully were in fellowship with the gospel. The biggest victories our work may win may not be here and may not be now. But Paul said it this way, I am convinced that he which has begun a good work in you will complete it. Will complete it. Our investment in the gospel will outlast us and our investment in the gospel will involve more than financial support. Now, I'm proud of the fact that our church supports a lot of mission works, not only through the regular giving, but different offerings here and there. But let me tell you, as, as much as I am proud of that, and we need to do that, and we need to put our money where our mouth is if we're missionary Baptist, Jesus said where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, and our treasure needs to be a mission work. But let me tell you, our investment in the gospel involves far more than a monthly check to mission work. In verse 27, look at what he says to this church that are partners with him. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our investment Involvement in mission work, our investment, our partnership, our fellowship. First of all, the gospel work involves every part of our lives. First of all, it involves the effort to behave ourselves. Let your conduct be worthy or compatible with the gospel of Christ. We're going to be really serious about reading the 
world with the gospel, we've got to learn how to behave ourselves. We've got to have our conduct and how we live to be compatible with the Christ that we preach about in moral issues, in kindness and love, in the language that we use. If we're going to represent Christ, we need people to, to see Christ and to see what he's like by looking at us. The gospel work involves the effort to get along. He says that you stand fast in one mind and one spirit. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it is not easy. But the gospel effort involves getting along so we can work together. And whatever differences we may have, we lay them off to the side. Whatever disappointments and disputes, we lay them off to the side. And we got one focus. That's to tell the story. Tell the story here and over there. And the gospel work involves Every single effort of every part of our life. He says striving together. The word striving here is the word that we get athletics from. And an athlete doesn't just show up at the track meet and run the race. But they train every day. The basketball player doesn't just show up on Friday night and try to throw the hoop, the ball through the hoop. They practice every day. So the same thing with any athletics. So we understand the word was used intentionally. The gospel mess involves every aspect of our life, every day of our life. Discipline and training. Oh, that's hard. You mean... I just can't just write a check and that's it. That's hard. But let me tell you this. The work of the gospel is worth the effort. The work of the gospel is worth the cost. Paul calls it the glorious gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul said it this way. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to everyone that believes. It's the power of God. In other words, we're on the winning team when we are in fellowship with the gospel. And, of course, we talked about the gospel as being the good story. The good story is good because it tells us the whole truth. It tells us the good news, but it also shares the bad news. The love of God compels him to tell us the bad news. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, where he summarized the gospel in and that Christ died for sinners according to the scriptures. And he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. Whoa, whoa, for our sins? That is part of the story. It's part of the story that God tells us the ugly part of it. So the beautiful part of it is that much more beautiful. When Jesus came on the scene, he said the same way. In the book of Mark, chapter 5, verse 15, number, chapter 1, verse 15, he just said, repent and believe the gospel. He didn't say believe the gospel. He said, repent and believe the gospel. Why? Because there's sin in our lives. You see, the gospel tells us the whole story. That's why it's a good story. See, the gospel says we're all as an unclean thing. The gospel in the scriptures tells us that our righteousness are as filthy rags. But the gospel also says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The gospel says our sins are all like crimson. It's stained. But the gospel also says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. The gospel shows us our wounds. But it also shows us the healing of Jesus Christ. It shows us our bondage. But provides a, the hammer to break loose the rock the locks and the shackles and chains. It reveals our darkness, but it shows us the light of the world in Jesus Christ. The gospel reveals our thirst that we all have that points us to the water of life. The hunger we all have of something meaningful in here that shows us the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. It reveals our nakedness, but clothes us with garments of salvation. It reveals our poverty, that gives us the wealth of heaven. It finds us as orphans, adopts us into the family of God. It shows us we're lost, but tells us somebody's running. Somebody's running to find us. 
and to take us home. It reveals our despair, but can fill us with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Folks, the world needs to hear this. We need to tell it. And we need to be in fellowship with the gospel. When we're in fellowship with the gospel, we're on the winning team. God will accomplish great things here and now, but maybe then and there. But as we prepare for an invitational hymn, the gospel of Jesus Christ, two things that we need to know. If you're lost, you need to hear this. Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're saved, we need to tell it. Because there's a world out there that needs to hear the good story. Are you involved? Are you in fellowship with the gospel? Are you investing in the gospel? Let's find out where God wants us in his plan of telling the good story to the world as we stand and sing.